Look at that. Look at that. Mm, that's nice. What's going on guys? In today's video, we are going to show you how to check the end float of your crankshaft. The engine that we're going to be using is an RB26 out of my R32 GTR, the one that you see here. Hey, hey, hey! <laughs> um, I actually think it's out of an R33 GTR, uh, but anyway, we're going to show you how to check the end float of your crankshaft. Uh, some tools that you're going to need to do it, you're going to need a dial gauge, you're going to need some kind of contraption. Usually they have a magnet uh, with a series of arms to connect to the dial gauge to attach to the block and then that way you can set your dial gauge up on the uh, end of the crankshaft to check the end float. Uh, you're going to need either a rubber mallet or a block of wood and a hammer just to smack the crankshaft forwards and backwards to get the crankshaft settled in the position that you'll see my dad do later. Uh, but apart from that guys, uh, I hope you enjoy this video so without further ado, let's get into it. Let's get into that shot! What's going on, guys? We have another episode. To start this video off, I will explain what end float is in relation to the crankshaft. End float is the ability for the crankshaft to move in a horizontal direction. The amount of distance it can move is dependent on the thrust bearing, which is usually part of the main bearing. We measure this typically in thousandths of an inch. Too much end float can create a force at different points on the crankshaft, which can result in binding and excessive wear. Too little end float and we can find the crankshaft seizing as the metal expands from heat. This is why it is very important to check end float when installing the crankshaft. Please refer to engine specifications or your engine builder's recommendation for correct clearances on your engine. End float uh, is controlled by this thrust bearing. There's only one of these. This is in the middle of the motor. Um, and you can see that these sides here, so the bearing has and a side on it and that that also has the same side on the cradle that you can see that one right there in the middle so basically the thickness of that side on each side determines how much movement the crankshaft has to move that that way well I guess you could say uh, horizontally side to side like this so as things expand, um, they get hot. Or well, as things get hot, they expand. So you need to have end float or clearance in there so that it doesn't bind up because you can have them bind up and start spinning. Is that right, Dad? If, if there's no clearance, if there's yeah. not enough clearance and it gets too hot, they can bind? Yeah, yeah, sure. All right, guys, I just want to give you a quick explanation as to what is going on from here. So we took the thrust bearings out of the box, we installed them, and there was half a thou of movement. Not enough. So what we did was we took the cradle off the engine, we left the bottom half or the thrust bearing that sits in the block, we left the crankshaft in there as well, we got a lever and we moved the crankshaft forward and back to check the end float with half of the bearing uh, thrust bearing in there. Now the reason we did that is because we need to find out which half of the thrust bearing is the problem. Now when we left, when we did that, the one in the block had about four to five thou, I don't really remember too well, it's about four to five thou of movement, which then obviously will eliminate that one from being a problem, so there's only uh, half of the thrust bearing left, so we knew that the one that in the cradle was a problem. So from here, what you wanna do is you wanna get a flat piece of glass and you wanna get some sandpaper to lay on top of that, uh, or some wet and dry or whatever you wanna use, memory cloth. Uh, you wanna have it about 400 to 500 grit, or you can look up what grit you think you might need or whatever. We used, I think we used 400 grit on ours. We also used some inox lubrication spray on it as well. And some people say to go in figure eights when you do it. Um, and then other people say just to go in circles when you do it. But you want to grind the thrust bearing surfaces on each side of that half shell um, as evenly as you can. Uh, and then don't forget to not get too carried away with it because uh, you want to always take off a bit less material than a bit more because then you have to buy a new bearing if it's too much. So that's what we did um, and this process, you know, I think we ended up taking it apart three times. So we bolted it down, measured, took it off, grinded, bolted it down, measured. We did that three times. 
and it took it takes a while. Uh, it took about two hours, three hours. So this video is not really a, a reflection of how long it takes. But anyway, that's what you do, guys. So then you can pop it in, and you can continue on with your build, and it will be that, and you'll be loving, you'll be loving it, chip. Fourth hour. <laughs> What have you got underneath the sandpaper? Piece of glass. Make sure it's 100% flat. Yeah, yeah, pretty close, yeah. Put a snot on there. I'd rather go a bit slow at it than um, try it and take off too much. Mm. Show for the guys watching. <laughs> Get a little bit of a touch. Mm -hmm. Alright, so as I said previously, the uh, first time we measured was half a thou of movement, not enough. So after redoing the and grinding the thrust bearing faces, uh, we have remeasured just below four thou of movement. So we're going to take it off again, and we're going to redo the thrust bearing sides, grind them down a little bit, and then clean them up and re put them in and check the measurements again. And hopefully this time it will be right. So you're happy with that end flow? Well, we'll fold it all down now. We'll pop it down properly and evenly. And uh, I think we're pretty close. Close in the paddock to it. Good enough? Mm -hmm. Near enough? Yeah. We've got four, four there, haven't Four and a bit. Four and a whisker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Oh shit, is this recording? Yeah, it is. Nice. <laughs> Damn it! I reckon that'll be alright. Nice! I reckon uh, Uncle Bob will be pleased to see it. Who's Bob? Auntie Bob, sorry. Oh. Auntie Barbara. Alright guys, there you have it. That is all the time we have for today's episode. I do apologise for it being a rather uh, short episode uh, on the scheme of things. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope you found it helpful. Uh, don't forget there is uh, also some, a lot of information on forums and stuff on how to do this as well. You just got to take your time. And this video really isn't a true reflection of how long this actually takes to do. I would say, depending on how many times you have to regrind it, it could take anywhere between an hour to four hours or three hours. Depends how quick you do things and that type of stuff. So. Yet again guys, I hope you have enjoyed. Uh, don't forget to check out my Facebook, um, add me on Facebook, uh, Reading Arding is my name. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram because I post stuff on Instagram way ahead of YouTube before they see it. So definitely check that out. I'll leave the links in the description and you've probably seen them pop up on the video already. So without further ado guys, as always, you know how we do this shit on Backyard Mechanic. We will see you on the next one. And we're going to see them beautiful red covers on the next one, too. Oh, yeah.